and thousands and more. We pray that we will bring many, Lord, to the foot of the cross. You'll make our lives fruitful vines, Lord. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we've been there uh, looking through the Bible at uh, discovering that Jesus Christ is very clearly evident in the Old Testament. We're looking chronologically. Last time we were looking at the book of Job, a fascinating book. Job is a righteous man and we, he was tried. He, in many ways, he went through suffering. But he came out the other end and was restored, just like our Lord Jesus, who went through the passion that was given him, that he might redeem lost sinners. And thank God he came through it. He set his face, the Bible says, like a flint. He didn't flinch. He went forward he, to the, drink the cup that was given him of the Father. And then on the third day, hallelujah, he rose again. The victory, the eternal victory in the heavenlies. For his kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is not of this world. We shall reign with him. And Job was a righteous man. And, uh, but the, the righteous man came. Him who had never sinned. And him in whom was no sin. Jesus Christ, the righteous man. Hallelujah. But now we're moving on to the book of Psalms. Uh, and where do we start in the book of Psalms to, to see Jesus Christ? You know, I don't know how to say this, but he's all over there. He's all over the book of Psalms. And I'm going to tell you something. You might not be aware of it. <clears throat> Sometimes we live, we see things in our culture. We see things in our situation. You know, of course, that the early church, the only Bible they had was the Old Testament. Is that right? Because they were writing the New Testament. They were writing the New Testament. They are, the Acts of the Apostles was being written. Uh, and <coughs> it was being formed. But you know, if you read Luke 24, verse 34, Jesus Christ said, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Did Jesus know that he was all over the Old Testament? Of course he knew. This is not something we're making up and, and we're superimposing on somebody else's religion. The Jewish people might think that. But then, you know, you talk to these any of these missions to the Jews. How do they show them Christ? They take them to their own, uh, to their, to the, their own Torah, to their own scriptures, uh, and they, they show them everything in it concerning Christ. And in actual fact, there are 353 prophecies in the Old Testament concerning Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Three, fulfilled prophecies, not just prophecies, fulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. Uh, now, statistically, that is impossible uh, to be coincidence. Hallelujah. 101 of them are in the Psalms. Now, I'll not be taking you through that. Don't worry. Uh, I'll not be, we'll get a, maybe a good theologian to do that, but I'll not be taking you through the 101 prophecies uh, that were fulfilled concerning Jesus in the Psalms. You know, Jesus... He uh, quotes lot, lots of the Old Testament. In his teaching, and if you read your Bible, if you've got a red letter Bible, you'll see the words that Jesus spoke. And much of it is actually sourcing the Old Testament. And uh, the, the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, the five books of Moses, uh, Jesus quotes them um, 27, uh, he quotes them many, many times. And then uh, by one man actually counted up how many books of the Bible did Jesus quote from and he actually quoted not just from the first five books of the Bible but he actually quotes from 27 of the Old Testament books 27 of them now which one did he quote the most you might think well you know he, 
Genesis, did he quote that? Yes, of course he did. He talks about, you know, the blood of the righteous man Abel. That's Genesis. He refers to the flood. He refers to it. You know, some people say it was the flood a myth. Jesus Christ refers to the flood. Uh, and he also refers to, in the beginning, it wasn't it so. You know, marriage is being destroyed. You know, a lot of the patriarchs had many wives. But Job stuck to what God wanted. He stuck to the pattern God had given. He was a righteous man. I'll tell you something else about Job if you study the book of Job. It says um, he made a covenant in his heart he would never lust after a woman. And he kept it. Now, you know, in the age that we live in, when we're assaulted with images, uh, you know, of images of uh, uh, which would uh, conspire or tempt us to lust. This man knew in his heart, because he made his own defense, that he was still a righteous man. He knew before God he had kept his integrity. And that was one thing he did. And he honored his marriage vows. And uh, God, of course, blessed him. But you know, Jesus refers to the book of Genesis when he talks about divorce. In the beginning it was not so. And he refers to the, to, to the book of Genesis. The way God ordained things to be. But you know, it's not Genesis that he quotes the most. What, well, is it Exodus? Well, the book of Exodus he quotes about seven times. He quotes the book of Exodus. And then he quotes the book of Deuteronomy ten times. And he quotes the book of Isaiah eight times. But the book in the Old Testament that Jesus quotes the most is the book of Psalms. Praise God for the book of Psalms. And of course the Psalms were sung. Hallelujah. Many of them were written by David, and David we touched on that he would give the promise that from him would come the forever king. The forever king would come from his there would come from him one whose kingdom would be of no end. There would be no end to his kingdom. Praise God. Hallelujah. And that the Bible teaches us in the New Testament, <clears throat> where you can see in your mind the, the early Christian church forming through the plan and purpose of God. It's not a breakaway Jewish movement. It's not a bunch of disaffected Jews who decided to start a new religion. It's not a cult. It's not the like Jehovah Witnesses or the Mormons who took a wee sidetrack and went off in it. It fulfills the, the scriptures. And you read what Paul says in the book of Colossians. If you want a very, very easy verse to remember, Colossians 3.16. We all know John 3.16, don't we? Well, Colossians 3.16 says... Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms. Admonish one another. How did they teach one another? How did they admonish one another? They used the psalms. And they used the spiritual singing of hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing to God with gratitude in your heart. Johnny Anderson used to refer to the book of Psalms as the Holy Ghost hymn book. He called it the Holy Ghost hymn book. Hallelujah. Now, you might think to yourself, well then, eh, are you going to take us to all through the book of Psalms? Are you going to take us to the very potent ones, the powerful Psalms where we see Christ on the cross? It's amazing. Uh, how that is um, seen by David and prophesied the, the dying of Christ. Well, actually what I'm going to do is something you don't expect. I'm going to take you to chapter 1. Chapter 1, hallelujah. Blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. It's a very simple message about choice and consequences. 
And people will still make the wrong choices, no matter how often you tell them of the consequences. But you know, it's interesting as we carry on from the book of Job, because it speaks about the righteous man and the trials of the righteous and the perseverance of the righteous and the acceptance of the righteous with God. And then we go in through, straight into the book of Psalms and what do we read about? We read about the righteous, the one who's planted, who is unmovable. And of course you might be thinking, well that's me, I'll tick all the boxes. I don't do that, I don't uh, stand in the way the sinners take, I sit with a company of mockers, I uh, delight in the law of the Lord. And you might think it's for a checklist for you to, to compare against yourself. But you know, when you actually refer to it, who is the man? Who is the man who meets the criteria? Well, right from word go, because we're going to get into chapter 2, there is one man who meets all the, the ticks and meets all the boxes. From the word go in the book of Psalms, it is pointing to one man, the righteous man, the same as Job points to the righteous man. Who is this one which yields its fruit in his seasons and whose leaf does not wither? Hallelujah! He is the one who epitomizes all of righteousness, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You know, it's interesting when you go into the early church and you go to the book of the, the Acts and you see this church who didn't sit with Bibles like we have, you know, beautifully bound and all the rest of it. They heard the scriptures read in the synagogue. I don't suppose they would possess them at home. I don't know if you know much about synagogues, but uh, I remember once speaking to one of these scribe guys, and it's a profession, you know, in the synagogue, they, they sit and they cock out by hand eh, the, the Torah, and, eh, you know, if they make a mistake, they've got to start over again. They've got to start over again. And some, somebody even told me at the time, that's a long time ago, and I was speaking to these guys in the synagogue, no, he actually come out with one of these scrolls would cost him about forty-two thousand pounds. It was a it was a trade. It, it took years to actually write these things out. So they went about and about with the Bible on their phone or a, a Bible in their back pocket. But they knew the scriptures in their heart. They knew the scriptures in their heart. And with Acts chapter four, you know, you read the story. You know how Peter went to the beautiful gate of the temple and the man was there and. Uh, he says, silver and gold I have none, but such as I have given you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the man was healed. And you know, of course, that Peter got thrown in the jail, got taken away. And they were commanded by the high Hegians. The Jewish leaders commanded them not to speak in his name again. Do you remember that? And they let them go. Now that was just the start of their troubles. There were going to be a lot of things going to happen to them. Job wasn't the only one that was going to have of uh, trials but you know when when they, that happened to them they went back to their own company and they reported just like we do when we have our testimony time they say you know what these people said to me you know Jesus, the power of God was displayed and what did these people do did they say well that, you need to tell everybody they say you've not to tell anybody about this you have to, or we will, we will deal with you severely you see and what did they do well which is what they said Acts 4.24 when they get the report back, what does the church say? So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, I don't know if you noticed, they haven't been that corridor there. They've actually got that verse up in one of the walls in there now. They've cut up when Bible verses put around the building. That's from Psalm 146. <laughs> what does they say? Is that what they said? Well, Lord... It, they left, you're God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. They gave God his place. Now these people wanted their place to tell them what to do and not to do. And that, by the way, that's happening in our country now. We're getting told by the government what we have to think, what we have to believe, what we have to say and what we have not to say. And already the police have been lifting a, a Christian people who are preaching in the open air because they're saying things that they've not to say. Now, there's nothing new about that. That happened in the early church. They were not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. Wait a minute here. Whose world is it? Whose world is it? No wonder when you get into the, the New Testament book, Acts, is it right to please men or to please God? 
And I'll tell you, if we're going to take a stand for Christ, it's going to get worse. Jesus says it will get worse. But he says, so they quote the Psalms. In verse 25 he says, Who by the mouth of your servant David has said, Why did the nations rage, and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So what understanding are they getting from everything that's happening? They're getting a scriptural understanding. They're now quoting from Psalm 2. They're now quoting from Psalm 2. These people who saw there that they were in the authorities had lifted up their hand against the Christ. They'd lifted up their authority against the Christ. And that's where we are. So let's move on to Psalm 2. And we'll read that. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king in Zion. Hallelujah, my holy mountain. Praise God, Jesus Christ is installed. He's been installed. Amen. Amen. Now, we know there is the earthly king. The, the, we know the lineage of David. But this is all pointing to something special here. Because right in Psalm 2, we're heading messianic. We're heading messianic in Psalm 2. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Hallelujah. Today, and I hallelujah, the ends of the earth, your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, listen, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the sun or he will be angry and your way will lead you to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Who are we talking about? Are we talking about David? We are talking about the forever king who is the son. Amen. The son of the father. Hallelujah. We are talking about authorities who rise up against Jesus Christ. Who dismiss him. Who in their arrogance push him aside. And that is the UK. The United Kingdom is doing that, by the way. There's no longer reverence for God or the King. And they plot against him. And they're warned. The Bible has warned them. The Bible has warned them. What did Sam do? It, says, it talks a bit like Sam Wonder. There's a way to go. You can go in submission to God or you can go in rebellion against God. There is a choice. It's not just individuals that make it. Nations can make it. Authorities can make it. They can bow down and give God his place. Or they can reject him. But if they do, they're in trouble. Now, we read this phrase at the bottom. Kiss the son or he will be angry. And what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, in the original context, the phrase kiss the son it refers to being submissive. Obedient. Uh, obviously someone greater than David is in view we know it's not David therefore you king be wise be warned you rulers of the earth serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling kiss his son or he'll be angry and your way will lead you to your destruction for his wrath can flare up at a moment uh, the, the, the new um, one, one translation said submit to God's royal son submit to God's royal son a beautiful translation so actually, if you look in the Bible, there are other, other references to kissing being submission. Uh, 1 Samuel 10 and 1, Samuel anointed Saul as a king. Remember that story? He took a flask of oil, he poured it on Saul's head, and then he kissed him. And that was him submitting to him, making a statement. <laughs> what the Lord tells Elijah, 
Remember, that, is there anybody who has not bowed down? Sometimes you feel that about Scotland. Is there anybody who's standing with the truth? Have they all given way to the PC stuff that we're getting drip fed? Well, there's nothing new about that. And God spoke to Elijah and he says, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. So this, these Old Testament phrases are referring to giving their allegiance to someone. Now in, in the Baal business, it's giving allegiance to something which is wrong. But in this, a psalm is telling us to give allegiance to him who is right. You think of Jesus when, you know, the woman came with alabaster blocks and she kissed his feet and she poured the oil all over his feet. She was showing utter and absolute and total surrender and submission to the Son of God. To the Son of God. So right away in Psalm 2 we get this wonderful picture of Jesus Christ. And the, the messianic implications are so clear from the word go that this righteous man, this one who is given of God, is the one who we have to submit to and show allegiance to. John 14.6 says, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Praise God, if we want to be saved, we need to submit to Jesus Christ. We need to bow down to him. And the psalmist shows us this very clearly, the King of Kings is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's so much in Psalms, I don't know where we'll go from this, but I just want you to get a wee understanding that the early church, they got the rich encouragement by studying the scriptures and seeing what was before them and what had happened they had emerged after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus and they only had the Old Testament to go on but thank God he is there and he's not hidden in all of the Old Testament Amen Isn't God good? So we'll move on with that we'll probably spend a wee bit more time in the Psalms So we're going to close our service and we'll uplift the Lord's offering Mine, mine, mine I know thou